All right, so we're now done with the user repository and you probably expect that we should start on the service, but let's actually create some helper functions to help with encryption and eventually handling the JWT. So in the core folder, let's create another folder called security, which will house all our security related files. So we'll be creating a file for handling JWT and a file for handling encryption for our password, because we're not going to store our password into the database as plain text. We got to make sure that it's encrypted before placing it in the database. So let me go into core and let me create a new folder and I'm going to call it security. And I'm going to create two files. So I'm going to call the first one auth handler dot pi. The second one is going to be hash helper dot pi. So before we actually get started with the coding, I actually need some dependencies to do some of the functionality. So first, let me do a pip install bcrypt, which will help us encrypt data for us. So when it comes to encrypting the password and placing it to the database, bcrypt provides some helper functions that will allow us to encrypt the data. We'll leave the cryptography to the professionals. You just want to make sure that any crypto library that you use is properly maintained by a team. It's probably getting updated and there aren't any issues with any of the algorithms that they utilize. So it is going to require some research before just choosing any encryption library. The next thing I will utilize is Pi JWT, which will help us generate a JWT token. And one more thing, this is really just a personal preference. Well, this, these are all personal preferences. But the last one is decouple, which will help us retrieve sensitive data from the .env file that I will utilize to hold the JWT secret and algorithm. Now you could use the OS library that Python provides, but decouple to me just makes it easier and allows for default values in one go, as we will see soon. But you're not restricted to installing any of these libraries. Do your research and do what works best for you. So let me just install this. And let me see. Invalid requirement, let me see. And probably this is not even needed from what I see. All right, there it is, no commas. And we're good to go. So let's start with the hash helper first. This will contain two methods or two static methods actually. One will be called verify password and the other will be called get password hash. So first we'll import um, some helper functions from bcrypt. So let's do from bcrypt import check pw hash pw and gen salt. And now let's create the class called hash helper. And this is going to be a static class. I don't want to create an instance of hash helper every time to utilize these helper methods. So I'm going to make it a static class with static methods. And I'm going to create a static method using the static annotation static method. I'm going to call it verify password. And what this is going to do is is going to allow us to provide the plain password, which is going to be in plain text during a login, right? And that's going to be a type string. And we're going to take in a hash password, which is going to be the password that we have of the user in the database, right? In the user table. So when a user attempts to log in, they're going to provide a password. We're going to take that password and I have this password here. Let me change that to password. And we're going to query the user table for the hash password. And this verify password uh, method is going to help verify that the plain password matches the hash password. And we're going to do that by having a Boolean check, right? So if the, and I forgot the intention, if the check PW, if the plain underscore password, let me just save this. If the plain password, and we, got, we have to encode it with the UTF-8 just to make sure that it is in a valid format and also 
pair it against the hashed password and then encode it. I forgot to close this one. Encode it with also the UTF-8. This check PW is going to do the internal check of checking if the plain password matches the hash password. And if it does, then we could just return true. Else, return false. Cool. And I've got to put this little colon. That's why everything's looking so weird. I was wondering, like, why is everything? Because I've got to put the colon here. Um, so that is the verified password. Not too bad. It takes in a plain password param, hash password param, and it's going to utilize the check PW um, function that bcrypt provides to check if the plain password matches the hash password. And you have to encode them with UTF-8 just to make sure that the, the format matches. Now, the second method is going to be a little bit more big brain material. Now, I don't expect you to know everything crypto related. But what the get password hash will accept is the plain text password and return a hash version of it. So what we need to do is, first of all, generate another static method. We find the get password hash. And we're going to accept a plain password, right? Because we're going to return a hash version of this. It's going to be a string. And what we're going to do is we're going to return a hash password. And what we're going to do is we're going to provide the plain password and we're going to encode that with UTF-8. And what we're also going to do is generate a salt. Now, generating a salt is just a process of generating a random string of data that will be added to the encoded password before hashing. This adds an extra level of security for attacks like dictionary attacks where hackers can try to utilize common words and sequences to guess a password. Now it's hard to use that when you added a random piece of string to the data. So, so it just added the extra layer of security for us. And what we got to do at the end is decode using UTF-8. And we're good to go. So now we have a verified password and we can get a hash password. Now let's go to the auth helper and create some methods for generating JWT tokens. All right, so let's go here. And first thing that I actually want to do is actually want to create that .env, right? So I'm going to create a new file outside the app folder, right? So it's going to be right next to the main.py and I'm going to call it .env. We'll need two things, a JWT secret and a JWT algorithm, right? So JWT underscore secret equal and JWT algorithm equal right these two things need to be properly hidden and secure especially the secret if any user has your secret and algorithm the token is essentially exposed so make sure that the secret is long and is not easily guessable but also hidden that's why i'll be using a .env and retrieving the data from a .env using the decouple library i downloaded earlier and even in production grade applications, you got to make sure that you have it tucked away and then injected into your application. You don't want to have it sitting in your application, easy accessible for people to see. So for the hash password, I'm going to use HS256. And for the secret, I just generated a nice little long key. And that should work. And now let me go back to the auth handler and we can start creating the logic for this. So let me import JWT. And also from the couple, let me import config. And let me show you why I like the couple, right? Because now all I got to do is JWT underscore secret is equal to config. And I just got to provide the name, right? So JWT underscore secret. Right, and there's JWT underscore algorithm. That's gonna be equal to config of JWT underscore algorithm. Now, let's go ahead and create the class and static methods. 
So I'm going to go ahead and create the class called auth handler. And it's going to take in and inherit the object, right? Because I want this to be a static class so that I could just call the methods without having to instantiate it. And the first method that I'm going to create will be to generate the JWT, right? So I'm going to make this annotation of static method and define the method as sign underscore JWT. And it would accept a user underscore ID, which is, which will be of type int, right? Because remember when we made the, and I've got, I've got the colon here and here as well. But remember when we made the user ID, uh, it's, it's of type int inside of the table. So I expect to receive it as an int. Why are we accepting the user ID to create the JWT? Well, this will be useful to confirm the user attempting to use our application and for queries. Because when we sign or when we create the JWT, we're going to create a payload. And this payload is going to include the user ID and when this JWT is going to expire. So when I decode the JWT, I can receive the payload back and I can use it for queries or any other logic that I need to use the user ID for, especially confirming if the user ID even exists in our database. So that's a little spiel on that. Let's go ahead and create the payload here. We're going to make that equal to an open dictionary and we're going to define first the user ID which is going to be the user ID and second is going to be the expiration time. So I'm going to call this expires. One more thing I'm going to import is the time, right? Because we're going to need the current time to know when this expires, right? So what I can do is I can do time dot time, which will return the current time and I'm going to add 900 to it and 900 meaning 900 seconds, which is approximately 15 minutes. So from 15 minutes from now, which is this dot time returns the current time in seconds plus an additional 900 seconds, that will be the time in 15 minutes. So it expires 15 minutes from now. Now it's good to set the expiration to a reasonable amount. It depends on the application being built, of course, because I'm sure a bank will want a shorter expiration time than a social media application. Having a shorter expiration time means the user will have to revalidate themselves again by logging in again because expired tokens will not work with the application. Now there are things like refresh tokens, but I'll go over that in another video. So we have the logic for the payload. Now let's go ahead and actually create the token. So what we can do is token equal to JWT dot encode. And what we're going to pass is the payload the JWT secret and for the algorithm, we're going to assign it the JWT algorithm. Cool. Just that simple, right? So it's going to take in the payload It's going to create a JWT token with the secret that we created and with the algorithm that we specify. And that's all coming from the dot EMV and we can return the token. And just to make it more specific, it's going to be returning a string and cool. Now we have the logic for creating the JWT token. Now we need to create another method that will decode the JWT token. So when someone attempts to use our application, they're going to send the token and we have to validate that that token is valid. Like we actually generated the token. We have the secret, we have the algorithm so we can get everything inside of that token. We can validate that it was actually generated by us. Let's create another static method using the annotation and I've got the T so I did and define the actual methods so of decode underscore JWT and it's going to be a token and that's going to be a type of string and what it's going to return is a dictionary, right? Because we're going to return the payload, right? And the payload looks like this. So what we're going to do is use the try and accept because when decoding a JWT token, a user could provide an invalid token. So when trying to decode the token, it could throw an error. So I'm going to use the try and accept to make sure that that's being handled properly. The first thing in here is going to be decode the underscore token. 
and that's going to hold, if it's valid, a decoded JWT token, which is going to be the payload. And to do that, it's going to be JWT.decode. And we're going to pass in the token. And the same concept of passing the secret and passing the algorithm. So let's do that. So it's going to attempt to decode that JWT token. And what we're going to return is the payload. So we're going to return the decoded token. If the decoded token expiration time, which you're going to retrieve uh, expires from the payload, right? Is greater than the time, the current time, right? So if the expiration time is greater than the current time, that means it's still within the, the valid window, right? That means it's not expired yet. But if the current expiration time is less than the current time, that means it's beyond that window, meaning it's expired. So if it's expired, else return nothing. So then we can go ahead and do the accept portion which will capture any issues that arise. Meaning if we try to decode this token and it's not valid, or if any issues arise while trying to decode the token, then it will go into this portion and we can go ahead and print something really quick. Unable to decode the token, right? Or if you have your own logging mechanism, you can go ahead and log here. Or if you have an alert system, you can go ahead and send alert. All that can be done from here. And then after I'm just going to return none. 